Good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. I want to welcome you. We're so glad you're here. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us online through our online worship. We're so delighted to have you as a part of our congregation in this way. And we just uh, pray that everybody will be blessed and enjoy our time of worship uh, this morning. want to give you a heads up that next Sunday, again, is the first Sunday of the month. It is Communion Sunday. We will be sharing in communion. Uh, once again, uh, we will not be coming forward. Those of you who are uh, in the sanctuary, we will not be coming forward or passing uh, communion plates. We will have a sealed individual packages of communion, which each of you can receive as you come in, as you arrive on Sunday morning. And uh, those of you at home, we invite you to join us as well next week. And if you will just prepare by having uh, a cracker or some bread, and some juice, then you can participate in the communion liturgy as well. We mentioned, uh, I think it was a week ago, that we are striving to uh, uh, strengthen our blessing box ministry. We need food. Uh, sometimes funds uh, are needed to actually go out and purchase food. But we can also strengthen this ministry if you would just, uh, when you're grocery shopping, buy some extra cans. You can bring them with you on Sunday morning. Place them. There's baskets, I think, at every entrance where you can put the food for the blessing box, and we will get it in the uh, correct uh, place uh, and uh, get it in the blessing box as needed. Delighted to have my grandsons, Andy and Sam, with us here today. We've had them uh, for the weekend. And it's mostly a blessing, but I will tell you it's kind of frustrating at this point in life when my son comes to Tulsa and takes me out to play pool. And, and now it's starting to beat me regularly, but now it's, a, it's even a worse insult when one of my grandsons is starting to beat me at pool. So this is getting, getting to be too much uh, to take, but we're enjoy having them with us today. I want to ask Sherry to come and tell a little bit about some of her projects and what she's got going on. Um, so we launched our VBS registration site this week um, we actually launched it on Friday and we're already up to 20 kids and only six of them I know so I'm really really excited for this opportunity for outreach in our community so um, please take that um, that link and share it share it share it everybody's welcome there's absolutely no cost and even if you don't get registered um, the, the only benefit of registering is you get the little craft bag um, of all the um, activities for you to be able to do at home. And, you know, if you can't come by, I've already made arrangements with a couple families to make sure that they have that, so they'll have that resource. Um, speaking of the craft bags, Miss Sherry has a little homework table um, out front. It's um, our VBS Roar logo. It's out there, and I've got little stacks of, like, little projects if anybody would like to take something home. For the afternoon or tomorrow, I need them back Tuesday so we can start dispensing them on Wednesday. VBS starts Saturday. Um, that's another um, way for you guys to pray. Um, pray that we reach these families. Um, we're having VBS for even if it's for that one kid. You know, there's there's a reason for it. So if you guys could just pray for these families and um, that that you know we we reach those that we that we were meant to reach. Um, also, because um, we will be I will be up here from Wednesday through Friday passing out. Bags. I just talked to Cave, and we are hoping to host a food drive for our blessing box. And so we will be here. I will be here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We'll have boxes out front, and we want to challenge all the families, everybody, whether you've got kids, green kids, youth, no kids. If you could help us stuff that pantry, we'd like to really see how full we can make it by next Sunday. If you have any questions, be sure and reach out to me. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I have had uh, a number of conversations this last week with our former youth director, Kira Calhoun. As you know, it was just uh, four weeks ago that she received her pastoral license, her first license, and received her first appointment in Bristow. Some of you know by way of uh, the news that she came into our office on Tuesday or came into the church to discover that it had been broken into and vandalized. Uh, the the word vandalize uh, you need to uh, is with a capital V did extensive extensive damage in that church from breakage uh, to bleaching carpets and furniture to tearing up equipment almost every room uh, in the church uh, was affected 
the insurance estimates now are in excess of $100,000 damage done uh, to that church. Uh, there have been four arrests. There is possibly another one under investigation. My understanding is all 12-year-olds involved in this incident. I've had a number of people calling the church and saying, what can we do for Kira? Uh, first of all, I want to say, and I know it was on several different news channels, the ones that I saw were on Channel 6. I was so proud. I thought she handled herself so well in her communication to the community and, uh, and the way she dealt with this. Her spirits, uh, I mean, it's a shock, uh, not, needless to say, to, to walk in and discover what, what has gone on. But uh, she is holding up well. But I've had a number of people have called and just said, what can our church do? Are there going to be work teams? Are there going to be mission teams and that type of thing? At this point, I don't 100% know what the response is going to be at this time. Insurance companies are still going in, they're documenting damage and loss and, and that type of thing. And quite frankly, some of the repairs are going to require professional um, builders or carpenters and carpet layers and uh, painters. I think she said almost every wall is going to have to be repainted and all the carpet. Uh, so some of it's going to be beyond uh, putting together a mission team to go assist and help. But she said she'd keep us informed. Uh, a word of encouragement I know would be uh, meaningful to her and if you want to bring that into the church or just email that to her we'll we'll forward that on to her but she is doing well and pressing on amazing spirits but we're, we're gonna do what we can to be a part of, of ser serving a neighboring, neighboring church in this time of of crisis I don't see any other announcements so at this point I'm just going to invite all of us uh, to enter into the spirit of worship and uh, would you please stand as we join for our call to worship Good morning. Good morning. would you join me in our call to worship Lord you have been our dwelling place in all generations from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. O oh Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may acquire a heart of wisdom. Will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy. Live according to it and grow in faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Thank you, Beth. I'm going to ask the, the congregation if you would stand. And may the peace of God be with you. Would you do a wave of peace? Kind of stay in your places, but turn and wave and acknowledge one another this morning. So glad to have everybody with us uh, this morning. Please join me in prayer as we prepare for our scripture reading. O oh Lord, open now our hearts to the reading of your word, that we may hear with joy what you say to us today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading this morning is uh, from Psalm 90. Psalm 90, out of the message. I lied to you, out of the Living Bible. This is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, through all the generations you have been our home. Before the mountains were created, before the earth was formed, you are God without beginning or end. You speak, and man turns back to dust. A thousand years are but as yesterday to you. They are like a single hour. We glide along the tides of time as swiftly as a racing river and vanish as quickly as a dream. We are like grass that is green in the morning, but mowed down and withered before the evening shadows fall. We die beneath your anger. We are overwhelmed by your wrath. You spread our sins before you, even our secret sins, and you see them all. No wonder the years are long and heavy here beneath your wrath. All of our days are filled with sighing. Seventy years are given us, and some may even live to be eighty. But even the best of these years are often emptiness and pain. Soon they disappear, and we're gone. Who can realize the terrors of your anger? Which of us can fear you as he should? Teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Oh, Jehovah, come and bless us. How long will you delay? Turn away your anger from us. Satisfy us in our earliest youth with your loving kindness giving us constant joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us see your miracles again. Let our children see glorious things, the kind that you used to do. And let the Lord, our God, favor us and give us success. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Wow, praise team, thank you so much. What a wonderful number. We are continuing in our studies of uh, the book of Psalms. We're not doing every psalm, we're just doing selected psalms, but this morning is Psalm 90. We're going to take a look at it. If you have your Bibles, you might want to open along with me. And I want to ask you a question this morning. If, uh, if you could have one request, if you could ask for anything that you want, what would you ask for? I think there's some people who'd quickly say a pot of gold, that would be nice, bring, bring that right on over to my house. Uh, others might ask for a second chance in life, if they could just do something different, start over, go in a new direction in their life. Maybe that's what they would ask for. Some, I hope, would pray for a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. That's what I've been praying about uh, very fervently over these last several weeks. It's interesting, uh, there is an individual in the Bible who had this opportunity, who was given this opportunity to uh, make a request, ask for anything. That was a man by the name of Solomon. I heard someone squeak it out. Solomon? Who, who said it? Hey, oh my wife. Okay, well, uh, she's probably heard this message before anyway. So. <laughs> Let's say it together. Solomon. All right. Now you remember the story. Just had to reorient you a little bit. First Kings chapter three he was coming into his kingship and the Lord said, make a request, make it as high as heavens. And uh, Solomon, do you remember what he asked for? Well, I hope we get this one right. He asked for wisdom. Okay. Now we're back on track. He asked for wisdom and the Lord said, because you haven't asked for a pot of gold or for power or a kingdom or might and all this type of fame. He said, I'm granting your request. So I'm going to give you a heart of wisdom. And because he had a heart of wisdom, all of this uh, kind of blessing of God uh, did come his way. But it's because he sought uh, to have wisdom in his life. Well, now we come to Psalm 90. It's described as a prayer uh, of Moses. And interestingly enough, this same theme is lifted up here. In this prayer of Moses, only in this case, wisdom is not seen as a gift. In the case of Solomon, it was like a gift that God gave him, a special gift of wisdom. But in this case of Moses, he sees wisdom as something we obtain, as something we acquire, as something that develops within our life as we go through our journey of life with God. In fact, in verse 12, I think it's the key verse of this whole psalm. It says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It's, it's, a, it's a situation of thinking about priorities. Our days are limited. Our days are numbered. We can only do so many things. We can spend our life... Uh, anyway, we choose, but only for so long, and then, then it's going to come to an end. And what's going to be the most meaningful way to spend our life? And, and the, the writer of this Psalm, Moses, says, Teach me to number my days, that I might, and it's different in different translations, obtain, acquire, attest to, that I might receive a heart of wisdom. For, for this writer, wisdom comes from reflecting upon our life and reflecting upon our life in light of the character and the traits of God and then acting in an appropriate response. Two or three things I want to lift up very quickly. First step in obtaining or acquiring a heart of wisdom is just to have a basic realization about ourselves and the situation in which we live. We see this mainly through verses 3 through 10. Where the psalmist, in this case Moses, talks about you turn your people back to dust, saying return to dust your you mortals. In other words, life without God is kind of meaningless. Life without God doesn't have much of a purpose. It's like dust. 
It doesn't really have much value apart from God. And we can pursue life and engage in life and, and make all these accomplishments in life and, and, and really try to, to achieve things in life. But apart from God, what are they going to count for? I remember years ago, <coughs> excuse me, years ago, visiting with a friend of mine and I asked him, uh, what is your goal in life? And he said, to make money. A very simple statement, make money. I'm going to make all the money I can. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to pursue my business. I'm going to do things that, 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 that enrich me. I'm going to make money. I'm going to have a big house. I'm going to have a wonderful car. He went on and on. He, he had quite a detailed list of all this. And I listened in amazement as he shared all this. And I finally said to him, well, that may be meaningful in some way, but they're never going to love you back. It's never going to love you back. There's a kind of a meaninglessness in life when it's lived apart from God. We go on in verses 6, 4 through 6. Not only is life in and of itself meaningless, it's fragile. Look at, look at verses 4 through 6. A thousand years in your sight are like the day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep people away. In the sleep of death, they are like new grass in the morning. In the morning they spring up, but by evening time they dry and are withered. There is a fragile aspect of life. Some of you know this. Some of you have gone through this with, with loved ones whom you have lost to death. And, and there was a time when it just seemed like they were so healthy and things were going well and, and worries were not on your mind about their health or their welfare, but then all of a sudden almost out of, out of the blue, it seems like health crises came upon them and, and afflicted them and all of a sudden we begin to realize how quickly and how fragile we are, how quickly things in our life can change and our health can change and our course of life can change and the stock market can change or things change around us. Life is kind of fragile. And then we go to verses 7 to 8. It's something that we have to come to grips with, and it takes all of our life to, to come to grips with it. There's something about us that is not whole. There's something about us that is undone. There is something about us that is sinful. There is an element within us that wants to lead us astray and lead us away from God. When we look at verses 7 and 8, it says, We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. For you have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your presence. All of us have secret sins, thoughts of our mind and heart which we certainly wouldn't want revealed to others. Thoughts of our mind and heart which we need to just make known to God because He's aware of them. Actions and behaviors which we certainly don't want to make public, but are certainly not secret to God. And so there's a sense in which we need to acknowledge to ourselves as well as to God that, uh, hey, we kind of struggle from time to time with all kinds of things, with jealousy, with, with anger, uh, with lust. All kinds of things can well up within us. Sometimes we don't know where they come from. But in God's eyes, God is fully aware of who we are, and we need to become more fully aware of our vulnerabilities. And part, I think, of obtaining a heart of wisdom is learning to know ourselves and our frailties so that we can protect ourselves. If we know our weaknesses and where we are vulnerable, we can protect ourselves by taking appropriate measures not to fall victim to these kinds of temptations when they come before us. And then it goes on in verses 9 and 10. And it reminds us that, that our days are limited. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. All of this life that we know, and, and some have led wonderful, beautiful, uh, meaningful lives, but it's all going to come to an end one day. There's going to be a time when we stand before God and give an account to God. So that is a realistic appraisal of ourselves. We are limited. We're fragile. We're sinful. And, and without God, we really have no true meaning just in trying to make meaning out of our life. That, that always becomes kind of, a, uh, kind of a worthless pursuit when we try to make up our own meaning as we go, apart from trying to find out what it is that 
God wants for our life? What is God's plan for our life? What is God's best for our life? But now the counterpart to that is, is living a life of wisdom is not only coming to a point where we kind of see ourselves accurately and objectively, but it comes to a point where we have a basic understanding about the truths of God. And I'm going to use just some key words that stand out to me in this passage. The first one in verse 11 is the word power. If only we do the power of your anger. Now here it's speaking of the power of God's anger. That God can be one who intervenes in, in the course of human affairs and events and, and uh, intervene and bring justice when he needs to. But his power is displayed in many ways. His power is displayed in wonderful ways, in many ways. He has the power to intervene in our lives in a variety of ways. And when we think of the writer of this uh, prayer, Moses, think of the power of God, how it was displayed in Moses' life. When you come to a point where you've got a Red Sea before you, and the people of Egypt behind you, and you're literally in the, in the middle of a rock and a hard place between the armies of pursuing enemies and a sea that's that's trapped you in and God demonstrates his power by opening the waters and leading you through and then leading you through a desert to a promised land this is a writer who knows about the power of God that God is able to act on behalf of his people in their time of trouble look at verse 13 and it talks about compassion this is a God who has compassion. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. And again, and again, and again throughout the Bible, we have the example and the proclamation of how God forgives his people, gives them a second chance, has compassion upon them. That is how he relates to his people when they turn to him in compassionate, gracious, forgiving, and healing ways. When we look at verses 14 and 15, it talks about an unfailing love which touches the deepest needs of our heart. It says, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for the many days as you have afflicted us. God is the one who can bring about a true joy, a true gladness in our heart because of his unfailing love. And we can be off on our own endeavors trying to pursue all kinds of things, but when we come to the realization that it's our relationship with God and the things that he has for us, his unfailing love that meets us at the level of our deepest need, we are on the path to obtaining or acquiring a heart of wisdom. And then finally, look at verse 16. May your deeds be shown to your servants and their splendor to their children. Here is a God who is able to act on our behalf. Here is a God who is actually able to do something. I don't want to get uh, too carried away here this morning, and I'm really not trying to make a political statement. I'm really making a cultural statement. But uh, I think it was some months ago, maybe a little over a year ago, our vice president made some comment. I don't know, it was kind of an off-the-cuff comment about that he prayed and he tried to listen to God and hear the voice of God. And there were certain, politic certain commentators that made a big deal about that. They said, well, that's kind of crazy. Someone who's listening for the voice of God, that's, he, he must be mentally unstable if he's wanting to hear the voice of God. And I, and I heard these criticisms, and I really think they come more out of a kind of a general culture today and a lack of an awareness of what it means to have a personal relationship with God. Because I thought back even to my childhood, sitting in the pew and singing a song, He walks with me, and He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own and the voice I hear, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, even as a child, I can remember singing songs about God walking and talking and, and, and affirming that we're his children and, and how we have this kind of intimate relationship with God. And I think it just shows in some ways how far our culture has drifted that we've come to the point that some people are saying, can God really say anything? Can God really 
talk to people? Can God really give direction or affirm them or assure them in any way? And and I want to sure, assure you that God can work on our behalf. God can speak. May your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor to your children. The splendor of God can be made known to us. So, what is the result? And it really comes to two key verses in this. The very first verse and the 12th verse in terms of what is an appropriate response for those who are wanting to find meaning and purpose in life and not just meaning and purpose but also to walk with a heart of wisdom and to live in a spirit of wisdom the first is verse 1 just two key verses that really stand out Lord you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations <clears throat> if we want to obtain a heart of wisdom we need to make God our dwelling place what does that mean? It means we hang out with God. We dwell with God. A dwelling place is like our home. It's a place when we're home. It's a place where we feel safe and, and love. And the home is a place where we're secure. And, the, lo- and, the, and the, the home is a place where we hang out with our family and our friends. And in our spirits, we need to hang out with God. We need to walk with God and talk with God and know that he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm his own. We need to just hang out with God and walk with him. And as we walk through every situation of life, and this is one of the things I shared, shared with Kira last week. I said, I know, I know you've really got an overwhelming situation, but this is not a situation that you walk into alone. God is walking with you through this crisis with your church. God walks with us into the fiery furnace. God walks with us through the Red Sea. God walks with us into a land that he has prepared for us. We need to make God our dwelling place, and we just need to hang out with God. And then back to verse 12. We need to reflect on life and learn from him. Teach us to number of days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This is a passage along with the 23rd Psalm that is frequently read at funeral services. When we read it, when it comes to that point in life where we're saying goodbye to a friend, we're entrusting them to God, and we read this passage, and in so many cases we're able to read it in such a positive way because we're, we're saying goodbye and we're, we're giving tribute to one who has walked with God has realized that yes, their days on this earth are going to be numbered, but that they can acquire a heart of wisdom. There's something about walking with God through life that we begin to gain a heart of wisdom. We begin to to approach circumstances and things with the mind of God, with a trust in God, with a confidence in His character and His ability to act on our behalf. We begin, we begin not so much. I think, to try to solve all of our problems on our own, although that's very tempting. But more and more we come to a point to where we can um, trust God that He is going to be there. And He's the one that's going to solve the the issues that are before us. And He's the one that's going to deal with the issues of our life. It's it's kind of interesting. There's, There's kind of an old mediation term or negotiation term. Human resource people know it and and others who work in managerial, it's called, what do you bring to the table? And when you have a meeting, sometimes you're trying to do problem solving in an organization, and you're, and you're kind of brainstorming, and different people will come, and what does, what does each one bring to the table? One brings one experience, one brings one insight, one brings some skill. What, what do we bring to the table? And we need to make God our dwelling place and realize what each of us are bringing to the table. What we bring to the table is our confession that God, we're frail, we're limited, We're sinful. (laughs) We can confuse ourselves. Uh, We need your help. That's what we bring to the table. It's it's not a whole lot other than our acknowledgement that we need to place ourselves in God's hand. What does God bring to the table? His power, his compassion, his unfailing love, his willingness to act for the positive for his children and and to be in benefit for them. That's what God brings to the table and if we daily rest ourselves in him and learn to reflect upon him and entrust ourselves to him I believe 
that we, like, like Moses and others, great saints of the Bible, can learn to evaluate ourselves accurately, but through this relationship with, with this God who cares and loves us, we can obtain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom may for some come as a gift, and I'm sure there are times still today when we don't know what to do, and God miraculously, graciously gives us an insight, gives us, gives us a thought. And that happened for me when I was in college. I didn't know how to study. This is the true one night in my prayer. God gave me a plan. It was just like unbelievable. God started unfolding a plan for me of how I could study, and I wrote that plan down, started implementing that plan, and went from being a, a two-point student to almost a straight-A student, simply because God, in a moment of prayer, gave me some wisdom about how I could organize myself and study, and it was wisdom that came like a gift. But for most of us, under most circumstances, wisdom comes through maturity. It comes through a day-by-day -day walk with God. It comes from just reflecting upon God and being honest with God and setting our life before God and allowing God to respond to us. And so, once again, I leave with you this, this one key verse. Because if, if we don't grasp anything else, we just need to hold on to and grasp the proclamation, it's the prayer of... Can you, can you imagine everything that Moses went through, all of the trials and experiences he went through? And it came to a time of, of uttering a prayer, and what did he say? I think we need to echo this with him. Teach us to number our days in order that we may obtain from God a heart of wisdom. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we begin our time of joy and, and prayer and sharing this morning, and I'm going to ask Mrs. Jerry to come in just a minute, I first want to receive two new members into the life of this congregation. And I'm going to ask the congregation if you would turn to page 38. And I'm not going to ask uh, these two to come forward this morning, but uh, for safety and, and just other reasons, if, if, if you would please stand, Jana Housley and Joanna Noy, and I know they're both here, and, and let's uh, first of all just show our appreciation that they're here and <laughs> wanting to make this their church home this morning. And so I'm going to ask you uh, the vows of membership, and you don't have a microphone and you're going to have to say them, you're going to have to shout them because uh, we have people watching from Texas and Oregon and all across the country, and, and you're going to have to shout in a way that they can hear you clear clear across the land this morning, so I'm just giving you a hard time this morning. But uh, uh, I am delighted uh, to have uh, these, uh, Jana and Jawani, to come this morning. And uh, I would ask you, is it your desire to unite with this congregation of the United Methodist Church? If so, just say yes. Okay. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its, min in its ministries by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And if this is your commitment, would you indicate by saying, I will? Okay. And as much as you are joining us this morning, this congregation is joining you. It's kind of like a marriage. You're, you're pledging to be a faithful member of this congregation. This congregation is also pledging to be with you and to walk with you 
in this journey of life and faith. And so, on page 38, if you found it in the hymnal, Members of the Household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care, and I charge you to do all in your power to increase their faith, to confirm their hope, and to perfect them in love. And what is this congregation's commitment uh, to Joanna and Jana this morning? We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Miss Jerry, can you take to each of them? We have a little gift for each of you. It's actually a packet, and, and included in this packet is a, is a little book called The Three Simple Rules, A Wesleyan Way of Living by Bishop Reuven Job. And we haven't got to do this for a while, so don't embarrass me. In this little book, it tells us about the three rules of the church, which are... Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. It's just a little devotion, but we want to welcome you. When the service is over today, and before you leave, uh, under normal circumstances, we'd have you line up and have everybody come by and give you a hug and, and, and shake your hand. We can't safely do that this morning. Everybody wave at them or clap or something and just let them know that we are welcoming them this morning. But before you take off and we get outside, if we can uh, get a picture of you real quickly for our cross means. But we're just delighted to have you be a part of this congregation. And uh, we want to do everything we can to be in ministry and service to you. Thank you all so much. Ms. Jerry. Good morning. Now it's time for joys and concerns. Um, the flowers this morning are in honor of Dorothy Schwer. She will be 96 on the 29th. And she, I think she's just a sweet, delightful woman. And she's just always so gracious. That's, that's one thing I appreciate about her. But the flowers are in honor of her today. Um, one of my joys last week is, I didn't say it because my kids were here, but my grandkids were here last week, and they loved to go to Gathering Place. And so I, I thought Gathering Place was closed. So I told their mama, I said, tell the kids Gathering Place is closed. Tell the kids it's closed. So she told the kids in Scout, said, Mama, I have been stuck in this house for five months. I'm going to use all five days to just talk all I want. <laughs> and it was sweet music to this Gigi's ear. So enjoy your grandkids, Pastor. Even if they do beat you at pool. <clears throat> Can you give me my phone? Yes, I do not like phones at all, but we communicate a lot before and during service with our phones. Okay, this week has been um, pretty up and down for us as a congregation. Um, Molly Humphreys, she what sings in the choir sometimes, sometimes she's back there, and people go, I don't know Molly Humphreys. She always asks us to pray for her son Mitch, Mitchell. And now the whole congregation goes, oh yeah, now we know who we're talking about. Um, she had been acting kind of loopy, and her husband Rick is going, Molly, Molly, and she's just brushing him off. Well, her son came last week and said, Mom, there is something wrong with you. So Molly agreed to go to the doctor, and she had a brain bleed, 
and um, she was had brain surgery two days later. Um, one of the things that I like to do is to go to the Dollar Tree. I spend lots of money and just buy some things and put them in a bag. So I bought some things and put them in a bag for Rick to occupy Rick's time as his wife was going through brain surgery. And um, I put in some peanut butter cup or cups of peanut butter so he'd have something to snack on and some Hershey Kisses. So this is Molly's text this morning. Thank you so much, Miss Jerry, for everything. You're so very thoughtful. I annihilated the Hershey's Kisses in the peanut butter for a makeshift Reese's. I love the prayer shawl, and I love you, and I love our church. Our church and God are good. So, I mean, after having brain surgery, she's eaten like a pig. Please share my joy. I am so thankful to be alive. I went from normal to a brain surgery patient in less than 24 hours. God is so good, much more than I deserve. So that was from Molly. And then right where Christy and Ed are sitting, Jason and Melanie Scott used to sit. Melanie Scott's name is Melanie's sister's name is Jenny. Jenny's husband's name is Scott. Again, he just started acting crazy. She got him up to the Oklahoma Heart Center. She got him to the emergency room at St. Francis, and he had a blood clot in his lung. It has gone to his brain, and there is no brain activity right now. So we've had just up and down craziness this week in our congregation. The sad thing is that Jenny is the only one that can go in and be with Stephen. Could you imagine that? Your son and you can't go to him? That would rip me up. Also, we need to lift, remember to start praying for Rusty Helms. He's going to have some heart um, surgery. It's an abulition. It's a word I can't say. And then heart ablation. heart ablation, where they go in and just cauterize some of the blood vessels. I know what it is. I just can't say it. Um, Melody Watson is a physical therapist at St. Francis, and as most of you know, there was a nurse that died of COVID-19 there. She had two people quit, two of her physical therapists quit, just said, we can't take this anymore. And so Melody just was under a heavy burden this week, too. And then Kira. If you'll join me in prayer, please. Man, oh man, oh man, God. Thank you for pastor's message this morning with the reassurance that you are in control. You were before the world was made, and you will continue to be after the world. Teach us to number our days. We're like grass that withers away. God, if you look at that, that can just be downright disheartening. Help us to change our attitude. Help us to change our look. Help us to realize that no matter how yucky stuff is, you have been there from the beginning and you will be there to the end. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, God, for bringing Molly through the surgery. And Lord, I lift up Stephen to you. I lift up Jenny. Confused, hurting, wanting 
the best, wanting to do what's right. Be with his mom and dad and, and brothers as they cannot possibly be able to tell him goodbye. Be with Melody. Be with all of our health care workers who are dealing with this COVID. And God, it's not even the hospital. Be with our officials that have to make rules for us to abide by in the community. Be with the school board people as they try to decide the best way to educate our children. Be with the parents. Some are fearful about sending their children into the fray, and some of them can't wait to get rid of them. Sometimes it seems almost pointless to make any plans because things change minute by minute. But the greatest news is that you have been there before you created the earth, and you are going to be there at the end. I just praise your name and thank you for the two new sisters that we gained in the congregation today. And God, they've been faithful to be coming before. And and I know Jenna is just so anxious, so excited, so wanting to get involved in the congregation. And, And we don't know how to do it, God. Hey, you just told us that if we need wisdom, we should ask for it and you will give it. I ask, Lord, that you give all of us wisdom in how to minister, how to comfort each other, how to encourage each other. God, you know that I wasn't very nice yesterday. I was bored out of my mind and being nasty to my sweet husband. Help us to take our eyes off of ourselves and to serve other people. Thank you, God. Thank you for this opportunity that I have to serve you. It's the greatest gift that you have ever given me next to your son dying on the cross. And now, Lord, please hear our prayer as we join together to recite the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Jim. Be blessed. Be safe. Remember, next week we'll share in Holy Communion. Uh, for those watching online, be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to hit the share button. Be sure to send it to 15 of your family, neighbors, relatives, friends, and uh, let them join with us in worship as well. And now go forth in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.